<clears throat> Welcome to our Decoding Dyslexia Wisconsin virtual chat. Uh, we usually meet in a more intimate setting at coffee shops, but the um, pandemic has given us a way to reach out across the state and to reach other people. And so I'm excited that we can do a virtual statewide chat and we can record it and upload it to YouTube for those of you that are not able to join us. So today we have, we don't usually have guest speakers at our coffee chats, but I figured why not? Um, so here's Katie Fortune, she's with us. Um, she's coming from central Wisconsin over uh, by La Crosse, Westby. Yep. And I'm looking for my notes here, there they are. Um, <laughs> she's a graduate of UW-Stout, um, a, a pro professional speaker and designer. So Katie can maybe tell you more about her design degree. Um, but what caught my eye was she had posted, one of our members had posted her um, different ability, I think, or motivational Monday. And I had caught your uh, discussion about handwriting. And I was like, wow, that is so interesting. And how, you know, you have dyslexia and, and it's difficult to write your letters, but you found a way that worked for you. And so that really caught my eye. And I was just inspired by everything you said. So um, welcome uh, here from all of us at Decoding Dyslexia Wisconsin. I'm the state lead. I live near Madison. So take it away, Katie. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for your kind words that you did a great job. First of all, I like when people introduce me and they do better than I do myself. So <laughs> I love it. So thank you so much. And thank you for having me, especially that you guys don't usually have speakers. I was so honored when you asked and I'm like, yes, let's do it. I do want to say like, I'm super interested in hearing about you guys as well and what you're seeing. So Katie and I talked and I'm going to tell a little bit, a little bit about my story. And then there's so much more. I mean, I could talk to you guys for hours. I'm sure like, and we can all connect at different times too, but I'll tell you like the, the big parts of my story. And then I'd love to open it up and chat more about what you guys are seeing in the school districts, you as parents, you as teachers, whatever, what are you seeing? What are the pain points? Uh, Cause that's very important to me specifically, like what Katie said with my motivation moment, I um, post them every Monday and I have a podcast and stuff. So I'm trying to put out information that can help uh, people that have learning disabilities and just kids in general as well. So thank you again for having me. So I'll start out with the good old story of Katie Fortune. So Katie said it correctly. I'm actually originally from the Westby area. I actually live over uh, kind of by that Toma area. I always call it the 90-94 divide. when People in Wisconsin know what that means. Uh, but I currently am in my day job is in outside sales. And so I actually sell commercial furniture for um, an amazing company here in Wisconsin and actually multiple places in the United States. And so I do have a design background. I'll get into all of that, but I love my day job, but I also am building um, an awesome brand and business, which I'm so excited about really focusing on kids with learning disabilities and kids with disabilities, or as I call it, their different ability and parents and teachers. So, and I'll get more into that and we can talk like openly about that a little bit more if people want to know or have suggestions please let me know, <laughs> would be great as well. So, okay, so where did it start? Honestly, the biggest thing for me was when I was young, like between kindergarten and fourth grade, I struggled so much in school. And, and I shouldn't say in school, I struggled a lot at home because I'm saying that that way because the teachers all saw Katie being fine. Katie's getting good grades. Katie's doing just fine. She's, she's great. She's quiet. She needs to work harder, but she's fine. But yet my mom, and I wish she was sitting here with me right now, cause she'd be like back here. Like, no, I was struggling significantly at home. So what I tell when I speak to teachers and um, parents and things, it's like, yeah, sure. Katie's getting good grades, but I was falling through the cracks right before my mom's eyes and my dad's. And my mom's like, this is so crazy. And looking back now, being 32 years old, 
I was struggling in school. I was scared. I felt, and I hate these words and I'm sorry, but this is how I felt. I felt dumb. I felt stupid. I felt like there was something completely wrong with me and I did not talk. So what the big, the big motivator for my mom actually was when my sister, who is three years younger than me, got into first grade and she was reading better than me. That was my mom's defining moment. Like, whoa, 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 something's going on. But before we even go into that, something that I really want to hit home specifically, because if any of you are feeling the same way and I get teary eyed talking about it, you're not alone because my dad worked construction. He was in construction for many years and he would leave early in the morning and come home late at night. And when he came through those doors, he would see my mom and I sitting at the kitchen table, bawling, crying, arguing, fighting, because my mom, she was a working mom, is still a working mom. And she'd come home from a long day of work and she'd come and sit and help me with my homework. And we would struggle so much. I would know a word here and I didn't know that same word two sentences down. She thought I was just being a little stinker. And I wasn't because I literally didn't know. And she tells me now, she's like, I feel terrible now that we know like what was going on. She's like, I feel terrible that I was pushing, you know, pushing so hard, but my mom is an avid reader. So she had no idea. Like she didn't understand. She's like, Katie, we just said this word. It's like, what? You don't know it here? It's simple stuff like that. And so when my sister started reading better than me, thankfully my mom had someone to compare me to because my mom's not in school. She didn't get to compare me to other people and no one likes to be compared. But in this situation, it was very crucial and it it was a huge moment for me. So my mom talked to the teachers again. They, they all said, you're fine. She's fine. She's getting A's and B's. What's wrong? Like, but you didn't see what was going on at home every single night for hours. And so my mom actually, because unfortunately at the time they did, wouldn't test me, I guess, in school. I don't know, this is a long, long time ago. I was in between fourth and fifth grade. And so I was like 10, I think, I don't, I don't know, tell me if I'm wrong, but before between fourth and fifth grade. And the, um, she, so she decided to take the next steps and actually, thankfully she works at Gunderson Health System. She's been working there for 42 years. She tells people she started when she was five. So um, she took me there and they got me a full test and spent a lot of money. I, I'm sure some people on here understand as well. It's not cheap. It is not, but my mom said it was worth every penny. 10 minutes of sitting in front with that doctor in the room. He walked out, he left the room, walked out and told my mom, Katie or Lynn, your daughter, Katie, she is dyslexic. I am 99% certain spending 10 minutes with her. And my mom's like, okay. And he goes, don't worry. We're going to go through all of the testing. We'll get everything she needs so she can succeed in life. Thankfully, right? Now I'm speaking this on my mom's side. And again, I love when she speaks with me because she really does talk about it. And I can get you the link of what her and I talked about on my video show. But she says, she's like, the first thing she thought of, she was scared and afraid and nervous because she's like, well, she know, will she know how to read? Like, will she be able to drive? Will she know how to be able to read signs? Like she had no idea, like how, like she went through this whole thing. She's like, I just felt terrible for giving Katie such a hard time for years. And I'm like, mom, not being myself now, I'm like, mom, you wouldn't have known, right? Like we didn't know, none of us knew. So that was what's so important. But I tell people to this day that the best day of my life was the day I was diagnosed. And because it was like my whole life changed within that moment. Now it takes time. I don't want people to think like I just woke up and I'm confident and can do everything. No, that was not the case. But my parents did say when I was diagnosed with dyslexia that uh, it was like someone put a quarter in me and I never shut up since. <laughs> like, because like I wanted to talk to everyone. I wanted to be out because I knew that I wasn't stupid or dumb or any of those things. And I love this part. I don't remember it personally, but my mom does talk about it a lot. And she told me this, especially when I started speaking. She said, Katie, when we were sitting in that room, the doctor brought us all in and he explained to you what, and all of us, what the diagnosis was, what this can look like, how you're gonna get help and how you are legally needing to get help. And so 
she sat down. The doctor said to me, he was a very nice man. He said to me, Katie, what are you going to tell your friends when you go back to school? And I have no idea where this came from. So like, if I could go back and high five fourth grade, Katie, I would, but I guess for my mom, she said, you sat there and looked at him and said, I just learned differently. That's what I'm going to tell him. And I think that's a really cool thing. And I really do think that came from my mom and my dad being so positive and so kind about everything and, you know, being there for me. Uh, but that was a really great thing for me to move forward is being able to just know, well, it's fine. I just learned different. That's it. Right. It's kind of that simple and it should be that simple, uh, you know, in a kid's mind and it takes time though. So some, there was a ton of things that happened in between, but I will say when I got into fifth grade, cause in Westby high school, middle school, fourth grade, you're in elementary school, fifth grade, you're in the big, bad middle school. So I went into middle school and I will never forget this moment. And this is the stuff that I love to talk to kids about because it's all about your perspective. And even as parents knowing, like, this is what we can talk to our kids about as well is the first time I ever got teased. I will never forget it. I will never forget the first time. And weirdly enough, it was the first time I left the regular classroom to go get help in a study hall. So I remember in, in a lot of my stories, I talk about visuals because now that I know all this stuff, it makes sense. I'm very visual. I can see things. I remember like, like the visuals. I don't remember all the other things, but I remember walking down the fifth grade hallway and had my books in my hands. And I was so scared and so nervous because it's the first time I had to leave and go and get help. And so I walked down the hallway and one of my friends came around the corner and he said, hey, Katie, come to the special classroom. And again, I don't know where this came from, but I stood up straight and tall and said, yeah, I am. And kept walking. Now I will say, I rounded that corner and I was like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? What just happened? And I mean, th that, that friend of mine, we were always friends from then on too. It's not that, but looking back at it for me, that was a moment for me to, I thank him for doing that, which is so weird to say, but I thank him because he gave me the opportunity to stand up for myself for the first time. I never, I never had to do that. And I actually got to, so there's just so many little things that I've learned over the years about myself and we can get into all of that. It, it literally would be hours. So a big thing, I know Katie, one thing she said, what was really important for her when she, when she learned about me and learned or heard the video was about when I, when I talk about writing. So through school, through high school, middle school, I did a lot of tests on myself. And one of them was I wanted to learn how many times I physically needed to read a piece of paper let's say like this, there was wording and everything to completely and fully understand it. So I did a test on myself with my teacher and we went through, I read it. She was just there, read it. I had to read it four times, four times. And if I read it out loud, it was so much easier, but quietly I had to read it four times to completely understand everything. Another test I did on myself, which if you can do this with your child, especially if they're really pushing back on using their IEP and not wanting to leave the classroom to get help or have longer time on tests and things like that. I, it was in high school. I wanted to see, do I really have to leave the classroom? Like I always use my IEP, thankfully, because I was in the meetings and we can talk more about that too. Um, but one of the things for me was I wanted to test, do I really need to? So I worked with my teacher and it was a, or no, not algebra, geometry. So we did a geometry test. I did the test in class with all the students. And then I did the same test, obviously different numbers and stuff out of the class um, without students. And in class, I remember I was sweating, scared. The second I saw someone stand up, I just started filling in answers as fast as I could because I didn't want to be the last one. And, but I wanted to try really hard on the test, but I was also super embarrassed that I was the last one getting the test done. When that first person stood up, I looked down and I'm like, I'm on page one still. What the? And I just, again, it kind of felt like I was stupid again. So I did the whole test. I don't remember the exact grade, but I super did not pass. 
And then I did the test outside of the classroom in by myself. I read it out loud to myself. I didn't even have someone read it to me. And I got an A because I had the time and no one was bothering me and scaring me around me, like getting up and moving the test, like all of that stuff. So those are just a few things I did. And there's a lot more as well that I did that really helped me learn about my disability so I could advocate for myself in the future. And I talk so much on at, um, self advocacy. It's super important to me. Um, and that's something I am striving with this business to help kids in learning about themselves, self advocacy, all about IEP is because they're super important and so much more. Now, the thing about the writing, I was very lucky um, to be able to go to college. I know not everyone is able to go. I, we took out loans. Good Lord. We could talk about that for days as well. But before I went to college or no, I did go to college. So I went to UW Stout, which another thing I would say, um, for parents listening to this right now is if your kid is wanting to go to college and all of that stuff, whatever they want to do, that is amazing. And I'm over here cheering them on, but please research your colleges for the college that will actually count your student and your, your, your kid as an actual person, not a number. I was really grateful that I had um, a great aunt. Her name was Lynn Fortune. Uh, she told me like, this is something you don't tell someone in like 11th grade. I said, I'm gonna go to this school and I'm not gonna name the school cause I don't wanna throw anyone on the bus. I'll have a conversation side, side stream of that. But I'm gonna go to the school and I'm gonna be an architect. And she's like, no, you're not. Nope. And she was really bold. I love, love her. And I'm like, what? And she's like, no, you can go to these different schools here. And I'm like, and of course my parents listened to her and like, we're on her side. So like, she's like, you got to go check out UW Stout. And I was like, why? And she's like, because you're not going to be a number. They have one of the best disability services in the state for kids with disabilities and they will get you the help you need so you can succeed through college. And I was like, fine, I'll go look. Long story short, love Stout. Went through Stout. One of the things I also would encourage people on, um, especially for kids who are young, even if they're in high school, middle school, it doesn't matter, they're still young to me. When they're young, have them start practicing, advocating for themselves. Have them start practicing. It may sound silly and weird, but here's an example. Every time I would go to a new class and I was brand new in that class, I would make myself, and this is on my parents, they totally taught me to do this, specifically my dad. I would go up after the class was done, reach out my hand, shake their hand. Again, this is all pre-COVID, COVID changes everything. Shake their hand and say, hi, my name is Katie Fortune. These are the services I need. And the disability services um, area, they actually had a sheet of paper that showed you different things. I'm dyslexic these are the things that I need to succeed. And every single one of those teachers were number one, super impressed. And they like, they saw that respect. Like I respected them. I wanted to do good in their, their class. Um, every single one of them, I could walk through Stout right now, still know me because I took that time and that effort to get out there and put myself out there. Was it scary? Yeah. Every single time I would leave the class and I'm like, oh my God, I'm sweating. Like I was so hot and like nervous, but it helped me so much. So much so that like I made all my professors my friend, like I really did. Even before I said the whole saying of me making friends for a living, I tell people I make friends for a living for my day job um, instead of sales. Um, but I actually was published in one of my professor's books in design. And I did all these things. I had three internships before I went out of college, which is amazing, but it's all because of those connections I made, but it started with advocating for myself and finding that confidence and building that confidence to be able to talk about my different ability. So three months before I graduated college, I got a phone call that really did change my life. And I got a phone call that um, my great aunt Lynn had passed away at 56 unexpectedly. And that was the one person other than my parents that I wanted there to be there for my graduation. So that was a really hard time for me. Um, and we'll go into that a little bit more, but sorry, I'm gonna backtrack because I know Katie said this and I really wanna make, make it clear. Uh, one of the things that I learned recently that happened in college, like very recently, I had someone ask me when I was building this business and this brand, Katie, why do you write in all caps? 
why do you write in all capital letters? And I said, oh, I took a class in college and we have to because I'm an interior designer. Like we have to, like architecture, interior design. But they're like, but no one else still writes in all caps. Like, why do you? And like when I was doing my logo and different things for my business, I'm like, oh my gosh, I write in all caps because it's easier for me to read. That's not for everyone, but I realized when I'm reading my writing in all caps or just all capital letter writing, it's easier for me to read because the P's, the D's, the B's, lowercase, don't flip. Like I was like, <laughs> like what? It was crazy to me. And again, it doesn't work for everyone, just saying, but it that was something for me. I'm like, oh my gosh. So when I'm writing in all capital letters and I'm reading in all capital letters, it doesn't flip as much. So I can read easier and understand things a little bit easier. So that was one thing that Katie had mentioned that um, I have a video on it, but it was mind blowing. And I'm not, this is not years ago. This was like this past year, I realized it. I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. So back to um, my aunt. Um, so she had passed away three months before I graduated. And when she, when she passed away, she was an incredible person. Um, and she had a celebration of life party. And this is where my speaking career started. Honestly, I actually just had someone ask me yesterday, how did you start speaking? Well, the first time I ever spoke was at her celebration of life party. Uh, her best friend, Kim Little, these are these, both of these names are in the disability services all over the place. Like they're great. They're from Viroqua area. Uh, Kim Little got up and said, anyone want to speak about Lynn and tell a story? And it was like an out of body experience. I was sitting there like in the room and there was a ton of people and I could just feel my hand go up. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I, so I, I didn't want to speak, but my hand told me I was going to speak. And then I told the story about Lynn and how she told me I couldn't go to that other college and whatnot. But that was my first speaking uh, event, I guess you could say. And after I left there, I had this overwhelming feeling that I had to keep helping people. I had to keep pushing and do this. Now, did I jump on it right away? No, I started speaking in 2012 um, to different like classes and students and different events. I do a lot with TIG and um, CISA 4 and all the different CISAs and stuff. But now in the last two years, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make this real and build a business on this because I have this like feeling that I have to keep say, telling my story and helping others share their stories. So no one's alone. So that is, longer than I expected to talk, sorry. Um, there's so much more that I can talk about in that, but that's the gist of my story. The big part is the struggle and that it's real and that you're not alone. It feels like it. And that's why I told my mom recently, I said, I think it's really cute, mom, that you wanna retire and all. You can retire, that's fine. But when you do, you're gonna come work for me and we're gonna go on the road and you're gonna tell your story and I'm gonna tell mine. So that's something that I'm excited about. But I'm here, I really wanna learn more about you guys and what you're seeing in schools. This is kind of stuff Katie and I talked for, I don't know, how long did we talk the other night? Like an hour? Like, I feel like- I don't know, my husband was like, uh, dinner. <laughs> like, are you still talking? I'm like, I don't know, we're still talking. I know, Chad comes in, he's like, are you? I'm like, I'm on the phone, dude. Like, <laughs> like, leave me alone. But it was something that I'm like, she tell you, when I've been learning more about what people are seeing in parents, teachers, kids even, what are they struggling with? What, are, what do they want? That helps me because I want to keep building things that can help support parents and kids mainly. And of course, teachers like fill in those spots that are not being taken care of, I guess, in schools specifically with disabilities. And oh my God, I could go on a rant about that. Um, so, but I'm not gonna. So first of all, does anyone have any questions for what I said or want me to clarify or go in more on anything? Um, I, I would love to just chat, get the coffee chat going. Yeah, so if anybody has questions, you can type them in chat or um, if you know how to raise your hand, you can raise your hand or you could unmute, so. God, I didn't even realize you guys were chatting the whole time. <gasps> oh, I have a lot of people people saying they had to head out, but it's being recorded, no. so. Um, yeah, Okay. anybody have any questions? Well, I guess this is Dawn. Um, kind of our story and where my questions lie, and I don't know if it's the right forum or just to start it, 
Um, my son is 10. He's in fifth grade. And ever since, you know, I remember back in kindergarten, last day of school, I volunteered. We went to the park. The teacher gave me a Ziploc bag. There's three other Ziploc bags on the table. It says, this is some special reading material for him for the summer. And I was like, oh, interesting. Didn't know he was behind in reading. Got to first grade. He qualified for title reading. Title teacher didn't seem to be kind of stepping up what she needed to be doing. He really struggled with vowel sounds. Regular ed teacher says, we got this. We'll, we'll do a pullout group. We're good. Second grade, he'll, he'll get there. He'll get there. He just needs more practice. Third grade, uh, she had some special training in reading, did a pullout group. We'll get there. We'll get there. Needs more practice. Keep reading. Keep reading. Um, fourth grade pandemic, you know, and last fall then in fifth grade, I was sitting with him and eventually everything started clicking to me going, wow something yeesh, like we're wow um yeah. then I started kind of researching dyslexia and said he meets quite a few of these tick boxes so he just got to neuropsych a month ago um came back with a mild dyslexia you know and reading some of the stuff that I'm seeing online he's very 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 mild compared to some cases out there he doesn't struggle too much but I can see when he needs to read write spell um it's super stressful for him so you know, we, my question is, you know, I called the school psychologist and said, you know, he's not bad enough for an IP. I totally understand that. But like, what's a 504? And because my concern, okay, fifth grade, sixth grade, he'll still be in elementary, but seventh and eighth, um, I don't necessarily want, I mean, I will, but I don't necessarily want to call the teacher. Okay, Lucas, he has these learning issues. Lucas, I want him to be able to advocate for himself for that. Um, but if a 504 is not in place, how would the teacher even know? And is there a role for a 504 there? School psych was like, he kind of gave me a definition of, it was quite a quote of mm -hmm. severe disability. You know, he needs, he had, needs to have severe impairment in his classroom. Well, he doesn't really, you know, he gets all A's except for English class to get to C. And we study those spelling words crazy all week long so he can get those tests done with. Um, and then there we be. So uh, other than teachers are more than insightful, uh, you know, we just had this teacher conference and they're like, yeah, we'll do whatever. They really had, were clueless about because he's got street smarts. He doesn't talk. He sits in the middle of the classroom. He, you know, doesn't want to be called on when they do worksheets as a group. He's feverishly trying to get everything filled in. Um, and once we have the teachers aware, more than accepting and more than, okay, what else can we do to support you two? Um, but from a long-term standpoint, and if I'd have a teacher that's not so warm and fuzzy, what am I gonna do? So I, I'll have Katie answer that part, but one thing I have to say is mine was not severe either. Like I still had the, the diagnosis of dyslexia and it was obviously severe enough. And I don't know all of the rules of all of the laws and whatever, I don't. Um, all I know is like, like, I'm literally sitting here, I could feel my mom being like, keep pushing. Like, you should just be like, keep pushing because the thing, again, I'll have Katie talk about the 504 and whoever else on here can answer that question. But for me, and I've talked about this and there was a little bit of a, I apologize for anyone that actually watched the video that I did this past week. I was very fiery on Monday about IEPs because I've been learning about that schools are telling kids to wean off their IEPs and their 504s before they go to college. That is freaking wrong. Sorry, but it is, it's wrong. And um, the reason I get so like passionate about it is because my IEP or 504, whatever you have is going to help me for the rest of my life. If I want to go be a CNA and take a test, I, like I have, like, it's, it's the law. Like I can have time on tests or like my dad even took the CDL many years ago. If he would have actually had a diagnosis he could have had that, you know? So, I mean, so did you, did you get a full diagnosis from the, and they're yeah. not, they, so like, did you take that to the school? What'd they say then? Well, I, I haven't had time to get them oh, okay. the paper report yet. Cool. And that was kind of like, I feel like that's kind of my next step. Cause after I talked to the teachers, I'm like, what he said about the 504, would you guys agree with? And they just got like big eyes and they're like, you keep advocating. Yes. Um, so that was going to be my next step is like, here's my paper. Uh, what are we going to do about this? Yeah. I, that's my number for me, at least on my side, because I'm sitting here like feeling like your son right now, frigging get that, <laughs> like get that information to them. Cause I, I talked to another professor just recently about all of this stuff. And she said that she's finding so many students that aren't even knowing that they qualify for these stuff 
or these IEPs and 504s in college, even when they have them in high school. And so like this girl almost failed out of college and thank goodness this teacher was amazing. It's like, something's wrong. Like you really love what you're doing. Like, I don't understand. She's like, well, I had an IEP in high school. And she's like, what? And she's like, why aren't we using it here? And she's like, I didn't know. And I'm like, no. So then that's where I was like, I have a lot of work to do. So, but that's for me, it's just for them for the rest of their life, whatever that looks like. And so they can have whatever accommodations they need to succeed will be able to go into what they go into as long as you keep it up to date. Now, Katie, I'll let you talk. I know you're, you probably have better information than me. Well, I, I mean, I have questions for Dawn. So did they run a complete evaluation for a suspected learning disability? Did the school psychologist do formal testing? No, we got a diagnosis through neuropsychology and then didn't go, I haven't, haven't gone any further with the school. Um, so there's, there's cut um, numbers for scores to qualify for a specific learning disability. It's written in state statute. Um, and if they don't qualify for um, an IEP in specific learning disability in reading, they can qualify for a 504. And Does the 504 have a like cutoff? Like, is that a testing and a score cutoff? No, I think that's just, no, that's a more general. Okay. Yes. So, but I mean, the first thing you need to do, the first thing I would do is request all of his testing that they have been doing at the school, standardized testing that they've been doing, STAR, iReady, MAP, whatever they've been doing, I would request all of that, those testing scores to figure out when they knew your son was struggling. Well, and then- this, Are those tests like given to all kids or are they just- yeah. Oh, okay. What are they, STAR, iReady and what? I would just say they're standardized mm -hmm. testing that whatever. they do throughout yeah. the year. Yeah. Okay. All the schools and do it. He probably, you know, all I usually see coming home is Alexiles. And when I have questioned every year, you know, he's normal because he does, he falls just on the low end of normal. Um, so that's where I don't, I don't know, you know, without those tests and I don't quite understand at all. Like I can see he probably didn't, he didn't red flag anybody from any of those numbers. They won't red flag anybody unless you ask. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they so right. They won't. And that's where, like, like I said, I seriously just wish my mom was sitting over here because she'd be jumping over me to get out of this. She'd be like, hold on, hold on. I will, and I don't want to scare anyone from this, but like, what's so important to me and why I was like talking to Katie for an hour and a half the other night was because, um, like, I couldn't believe, like, guys, it's been 20 plus years since I've been diagnosed. And I'm like, why are we still having these issues <laughs> this long? I'm just like, and then I said to her, I'm like, looks like I have a lot of work to do, but my mom fought so hard. And that's one thing I do want to say before we all disperse sometime, because I don't want to forget. And we can go into this more, Katie, you can tell me if you want me to talk more about it, but if they have a 504 and an IEP and they're getting, they, they have the meetings, right? The meetings that they have for the kids, please, please include your child. And they're not going to want to, they're not going to want, they're going to be like, eh, gross. I don't, I don't even understand. That's great. Please have them sit there and listen. It's going to suck. They're not going to like you, but let them listen to this. Because one of the things I said, and it hit me and I said it to Katie the other night, one thing I said was, that's so important to me was, oh my gosh. Cause people say, why are you so like, why were you so confident? I said, I could be because I saw my mom fight for me every time in those IEP meetings, you know? And my dad, don't get me wrong, he was so there for it too. Not that he wasn't, he was there for it. But for me, I'm like, they fought so hard and I got to see that. And then it helped me learn that like, my mom's saying, no, we're gonna do it this way. <laughs> She'd be like, oh, you wanna, no, no. She needs more help, you know, whatever that looks like. And so she didn't know any of that stuff either. I want you to know that she learned along the way it was, that was so blindsiding to her too. Like, wait, why wasn't she tested? Why wasn't this a red flag? So if anything out of this whole conversation, please include your kids on the IEP meetings for the rest of their lives until they don't have to go to the meetings anymore. A senior year when you're done out of college or you're in college or working force, whatever you're doing, please, 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 please. Because it helped me. And even though they're gonna say it does it and they're gonna be like, that's stupid, they listen they see you fighting, they're gonna be proud that you're their mom or their dad because you're fighting for them. So that's my one thing. Susan, did you have something to add? My husband has a question. Oh, okay. Yes. Hi, good morning. Um, I am Marcelo. Um, morning. And I, uh, 
I actually, um, Susan and I struggle with our youngest kid. Um, I, I'm a speech therapist, that's my training. Uh, however, I do not practice that. I, have, I practiced like over 30 years ago. Um, I recognize the signs of dyslexia in my kid early on, and we push the school to have tested. And they, at that time, they say they don't test for dyslexia. And I, I, I feel kind of guilty now for not pushing myself more to them to get the help she needed early on. Uh, the school tried different things. They put some reading uh, specialists for her, and she loves to read. And they, that because she grew up in a bilingual household, they also will try to give a ELL uh, assistance, English language learners used to be called English as a second language before. Uh, we, we thought that say, she doesn't need that. She, she definitely, she, she, English is her first language. She was born in here, so she doesn't need a ELL. But my question is, um, to um, speaker, how will you address to how, what will you suggest in, for a kid who is being diagnosed with dyslexia, is kind of reluctant to accept that, and it's not really, uh, it's not like she, she's it's kind of still in denial of that, and perhaps a little ashamed of, of being like that, and not advocating for herself. That's well, my question. I would like to hear about that. I want to come hang out with that. your daughter, first of all. So I'm just going to, we're going to, when COVID's done, we're all getting together because here's the thing. I want to keep saying thank you so much for that question and that information. Um, it wasn't easy. I don't want anyone to think that Katie just is like, yay, I'm dyslexic. No, like I fought it. I didn't want like to be different. And that's one of my biggest goals now is, and that's why I call it a different ability I do it for the kid. That's the only reason I do that for myself and for the kids. Like, yeah, I'm dyslexic. I have a disability, but I call it my different ability because I just learn differently. And I think really, I really think it's because of my parents and them just making it normal. Not like, oh, you need to go to another classroom because you're special. No, they never, you know, it was like, hey, you just learned different, Katie. And I'm sure you were totally doing that. And I will tell you again, I really, next time Katie, I'm having my mom here because she would be like, yeah, Katie was a pain in the butt because she, because I was, I didn't want to be that. But the more I learned within the household and, and thankfully I had wonderful teachers as well. I will say that, but seeing my mom and dad talk about it and just make it a normal thing. Like in the big one too, honestly, and I said, I, I forgot to say this. I, I did a speaking event um, many years ago and I asked if it was okay for my mom and my dad to speak with me. And my mom told her side of the story. And then my dad came up, which I get, I guarantee he'll never do it again. Cause I think it scared him so much. He came up and his, what he said made the entire audience cry. He said, the day I learned Katie was dyslexic was the day I learned I was too. And he learned, he never knew. And so for me, like my parents were so good about being like, did you know so-and-so is dyslexic? Like big name people like, oh, Katie, you know, look at what they're doing. They're dyslexic and they're not letting that stop them. You know, like really encouraging that in that child. And I'm sure you guys are doing that, but those are some of the like, little tricks that I remember them doing. Like I saw my dad, he is the smartest man I know. I really truly believe that to this day. He can build anything. And that's the other thing, finding things that they love to do. I loved Legos. I loved playing on the Sims back in the day because that was cool. I loved all of these things because I could visualize and build. Then I just realized, well, I'm just really good over here and doing this. I don't, I don't really like reading, you know, but guess what? I can listen to a book on tape. So I think just... And also have like her and I can hang out. That's another thing. So, um, but having that and seeing people that are maybe like her, right. And like, what are they doing with their lives? What are the things that they're doing? It may make it feel more like, oh yeah, I just learned different. Just like her. I can do all the things I want to do. I don't know if that helps. I hope it does, but that's what I, that's what I feel like was 
helpful for me as a kid, seeing all of the celebrities or the everyone that, oh, wow, they're dyslexic like me? Cool, you know? So I hope that helped. Thanks for the answer. It does help, um, you know, she's she's young yet. I mean, she's still uh, a teenager <laughs> and uh, figuring out things in her life. And obviously, you know, um, I hope that she will, um, I mean, she's, she's going to um, cosmetology school. She loves doing that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's struggling yet. Uh, but I, I guess that she, she will, um, as he, she ages, <laughs> she'll, she'll get the courage to, um, I, I, I wouldn't say that she's in denial yet, but this, I think she's still a little bit, I don't even know if the word is a shame, I guess a little afraid to yeah. let the teachers know that what condition she has. Um, so, but we don't definitely we don't want her to uh, her her vocational training to go through the struggles she did while she was in high school. So, um, thanks for the information and uh, for answering my question. Um, you know, and I and there's a lot of work to do yet in the social system in this country here and in this state per se because I, I believe that uh, every school should have a speech therapist in there early on to diagnose them early in curtain garden. So they'll get the uh, uh, the help they need early on and not just when the kids start getting in trouble and then try to figure out what's going on. And then uh, given the help they think they need, but it's not addressing the root of the problem. So it's not like they can't read. It's like they, dyslexia is a problem with coding, decoding. The brains they just they, they don't decode that, and a reading specialist is not is not if he's not training this lecture, he will not know that. Yes, the kids learn to learn like my kid did. She loves to read, to read, and she will read and read and read and read. And then if you're not paying attention to it, she will just switch one word to another word, just because they don't want to get stuck in there. So um, thank you for that, and uh, just thank you know. Um, Dads are also involved in these two, although are not like a, <laughs> participating in meetings like, like this. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and uh, I, I do want to thank you for all the things they're doing. And hopefully, um, that what's going on right now it will help the next generation so they don't have to suffer through that, uh, how our kids are going through. Yeah. And But then there's a lot of situation in there. It's not just uh, we teach it, but it's, it's a political issue and it's, it's um, economical issue because they, sadly, um, it depends who is loving them, you know, is the, because they, they they need to probably, the reading specialists, they, don't want, they think they're going to lose the job because they're going to bring other people who are training these legs to do their jobs. Shouldn't be that way. Should be, you know, that's why they have let, people let, like us. Let, let the reading specialists get training these lectures so that they, they know how to help them better. Yeah, but, but you know, we live in a different cluster. political issue right now that it's um, a lot of needs to change. I, well, I agree with you. And I guess what? That's why they have people like us, awesome parents like you guys, and awesome parents that are like stepping up for their kids that are going, they're not going to let this happen. So we have to keep moving forward together. And I think that's so great. So thank you for being amazing parents. And being there for your kid, that's like the, like, that's the number one thing that I tell my parents, they were always there for me. That's it. And I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. And keep Thank you. being there for her because you're doing great. Thanks for asking that question. All right. We have two more hands raised. Carrie? Katie, why don't you take the other one first? Okay. I'm going to tell my story. So. Okay. Um, Jay um, Shug? Yes. Hi. Hi. Go ahead. Uh, well, I, I guess my child who is now an eighth grader could kind of be an amalgam of the previous two questions, people who asked questions, and that's not surprising, of course. Um, it, again, she's an eighth grader. She has a 504. Um, and my question, I have a couple of questions about, um, I'm concerned about her transition into high school, because um, I think all of this just 
snowballs uh, with the homework load and et cetera. And I wondered uh, when you mentioned earlier about researching colleges, I'm wondering what you recommend. Do you, is there a website? What kind of resources are there out there so that you can research colleges? Um, and then the other question I have is about foreign language requirement that's needed for college and what insights you have for that. Um, it's, it's really unfortunate because my child would love to do um, sign language. And it is offered within the school district, but at a different high school. And that would not work for us. And it's not offered virtually is what I'm being told. So she does want to take a foreign language. She's taken seventh and eighth grade uh, foreign language. And she said to me, and she's getting a B in it right now. Um, and did last year too, when they were in person, but, and, and that's the kind of student she is. Um, but she just said, I can try to figure out how to put these words, these letters together and the words that she said, it's meaningless to me. It does not mean anything to me. So I'm wondering if you have recommendations um, about just about the foreign language requirement. She's, she is signed up, she signed up for Latin for, for high school. So we'll see how that goes. But I'm, I'm curious about your insights for both those questions. First of all, your daughter's awesome because foreign language can go out the window for me because I was like, nah. Yeah. Like, and I'm glad she's like, that's amazing. I will tell my little story about foreign language and then Katie and Carrie and anyone else that wants to tell me I'm wrong and you can't do that anymore, let me know because <clears throat> it's been a long time. But what I actually did uh, because I actually did not take a foreign language. And again, I have a diagnosis with dyslexia um, and IEP and all that stuff. Um, I was worried because one of the colleges I was going to apply for, this is like, I didn't take foreign language in high school at all. And uh, my amazing, amazing disability services teacher, and she's actually on my podcast, I think in a couple weeks or next week. And we talked about this a little bit. I'm pretty sure I have to edit it today. Um, we talked about that. And I said to her, um, I didn't take foreign language. What I do, she goes, what you're going to do is you're going to write a letter and you're going to connect it with that, um, with your application to that college. And I actually applied for, um, university of Minnesota and you have to, you, they don't even look at you back in the day. They may changed it. They won't even look at you if you don't have two years of foreign language. I, and I think my first time I took my, um, ACT was I got a 21 and Nowadays, I think that's not even that great, <laughs> but back then it was actually pretty decent. Um, but to get into UW um, Minnesota, it was not, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have flown. So I took the test. I put everything together. Um, I uh, wrote a letter and Gina Dahl, she read it over. We had it all figured out, sent it in. I got accepted because I wrote a letter about what, like, I am dyslexic. I don't even like English. <laughs> like I was like, English also can go out the door. And yeah. so I talked about that and was very honest and just wrote it out. I should try to find it back. I think I probably have it somewhere. And I wrote a letter, she helped me. And I got in on a 21 and not having foreign language because of uh, truly because of that letter. And so number one, even if it's not like the way you should do it these days, like if you guys all tell me like, oh, we can't do that, do it anyways, because like, what are they going to do? Say, no, you can't do that. Like, okay, fine. Well, she just didn't get in then. But that is one thing I did put with all of my applications into college, every college I applied for. And I got into every single college that I wanted, I applied for because I put that letter in there and I put it out there and explained it. And, um, I also, of course, put a blurb about how testing like ACTs are is bogus as well, because not everyone's good at testing me. And so like, so I like, and again, it was a nice letter. I wasn't as feisty back then as I am now, but that is one thing I did there. And for colleges, I literally wrote this down because I'm going to, um, that's one of my lists. And I think Katie and I talked about it as well is at least for me, I'm going to put together a list of colleges that I know that do really well in Wisconsin and I'm working on trying to partner up with some of these colleges. I will say hands down, still no to this day, Stout is one of the best like with disability services. 
um, because my, one of my best friends, she went, she just is finishing her master's degree. She has a learning disability and she worked in the disability services department. So they are still one of the best, but I can, I can, uh, I'm going to put together some of that and kind of maybe collaborate with some of you others. And then we can put together a list. I'm sure there is a list though. Isn't correct, Katie, or no? There's, There's not, not a list. Not, not, a great, great list. not a great list. Well, then I'm going to do it. Yes. <laughs> so. um, can I, I just wanted to follow up with you, Katie, because my daughter just graduated and, and just want to tell you that once they turn 14, they're considered career ready um, when they turn 14. And so we were in a larger school district, but um, we were in Nina Joy school district, but she, my daughter was assigned because she had the IP was assigned um, a um, case manager. And so I, with, I don't know if you, you said your daughter at a 504, did you say? Yeah. So she'll still have a, a 504 team. You, know, you still have a team. Um, so you might want to press the school a little bit more just to find out about what under a 504, what the career readiness piece of that is. But they really reinforced that case manager really reinforced of what the needs were for my daughter in each of those classes. So they have a, a even in high school, they have an assistant that's in the class to follow uh, um, what the assignments are, make sure they're accommodating for her, my daughter to make sure she understood the assignments and that they, there's just a lot of technology they can use now to help put those videos on, things like that for them to follow up and then follow up with them, um, kind of checking in with the case manager. So if you can see about that service, kind of really, really have the high school, the, when you're, when she's, as she's transitioning there, get together with the team to find out what exactly they're going to do. Um, and potentially look at maybe does she need the IEP for more so when she gets college ready, they may be more open to it because it is a new, there's a new level of funding that, that comes populates in at the high school level. That's not at the middle school level. It's pop, populates at about age 14. So just to look for that. And then just want to, I want to put in a plug for UW Oshkosh. Never knew, okay. I went there for, I went there for, I don't, I went there from 89 to 94, never knew Project Success existed till about two to three years ago when, um, when my daughter had dyslexia and a colleague that goes there uh, told me about it. I mean, amazing. They have a dyslexia, you know, uh, an entire center um, about dyslexia within UW Oshkosh mm. for accommodation. And so I just think that's amazing. That's I can't believe I never knew about it. I can't believe it's not more well-known even out there, out and about. And so I, it's in the Department of Education. It's kind of a weird thing piece of that part of it for me, but um, because they don't always teach about dyslexia to their teachers, but that's, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. So, so good luck and really be a good, being a great advocate, I think is going to help you. Thank you. And what was your name? I just, I'm writing everyone's name down because I want to like follow up. Jane, J-A-N-E. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure. Is that, did that answer your questions? Yes, it's it. Listen, we're, we're all in the same boat of, of just feeling like we're in a room that's not lit, not lit well at all. Um, at best, there's maybe a, a crummy nightlight in there. And that's, and that's how I have felt through this whole thing. I had to fight just to, just to you know, get the 504. Because um, like Dawn, the, uh, the participant who asked a question a, a couple people ago, um, you know, just my, my child is the same. She she's, has never been flagged, um, you know, all throughout grade school. And I was dismissed completely out of hand. Um, the small testing that they, that they did for her, they said she qualifies for nothing. She gets great grades. She's very attentive, all this. So, you know, any, the 504 that, that um, I fought for, for her to get was completely based upon my going again, just like Dawn to, uh, to a private, a neuropsychologist and, and getting that assessment done. And also um, having her with a private tutoring with an, you know, with, um, OG, but uh, on, you know, privately, and I'm somebody that was able to do that. 
But there are so many people out there who do not have the ability, the resource to be able to do that. And that to me is just the great sadness. Well, crap. Now um, I got to start a nonprofit and get a bunch of money so all these kids can get tested. Thank you for making me have another thing on my list. No, you don't, Katie. They're already getting tested. Parents just need to request the testing assessments because they're not telling the parents. So we need to do a public awareness campaign is what we need to do. It's state law. Yeah. Well, I do know, I have heard from other people too, though, that it is some school districts are terrible at like just absolutely terrible to actually like Jane what you just said like that is very valid that's why my parents went and took me somewhere else because it was like oh it's a big deal like oh and it's like what the freaking frick and my mom just felt like it was like time wasted you know she's like I can't my kid ah oh, I've talked to so many parents so yes we're gonna be aware of that for sure but then I'm gonna have this secret place that everyone can come and be able to, if they needed to get their kids tested too because I I just agree like that or I agree like oh, it should be that way. And yeah, public awareness, yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, it's, it's so hard. And even, and even trying to argue for an IEP in a 504, they said, well, she doesn't qualify for an IEP at all. And they said, and she does so well in school and even her map testing, you, you referenced that, um, Katie, which was, which was helpful and good to mention, you know, about looking at those scores. Um, uh, but I said, you know, her pro look at look at the processing speed. The, her Jane. processing speed was less than five per, like in less than five percentile. It was, and I said, how you know, it, this is, this is just so evident why we're into some of these, you know, issues. And and my daughter's very introverted. It's it's a great struggle to try to get her to advocate for herself. And that, that's just her nature. And, and some of that may go to the processing speed. I understand that. Um, uh, it's, it's all rolled in together, but it's, it's, it's a difficulty. So it's, it's good to hear um, other people here on this forum today and to hear your input. Jane, you get your daughter to contact me, okay? Because <laughs> I just want to connect and like round myself around all these kids to be like, let's do this together. And that's like my biggest goal. I literally have a new t-shirt I just put out. It says, yes, I'm different. Hashtag not sorry. It's so cool. Like being able to just talk about it and it get, takes time, but you're doing such a good job being an awesome mom. I just have to say that yeah. you're being such a, oh gosh, good job. Thank you for answering. Um, so I put in the chat, we have a survey that everyone can fill out. I'll email it out again. If you joined us um, off of the Facebook post and you didn't register, if you can just put your email in the chat and then we can add you to our newsletter list. Um, I just wanted to let you know about that opportunity. And I will email the survey again afterwards if it's easier to do it later. Um, I think Carrie, you had your hand raised still. Hi, yes, uh, my name is Carrie Ballman. I uh, work with Katie, I'm co-lead for Decoding Dyslexia of Wisconsin. I also um, am huge in advocacy. So I kind of wanted to like touch base on a couple of the questions that were already asked, but then also quickly, cause my story could be like Katie's and it could be forever. And I would be sitting here two hours later still telling my story. Um, so I'm going to quickly start with my story and try to do a very short version of it. But um, my son, who is now 11, uh, grade five, it was diagnosed with first ADHD and then second dyslexia. We had two neuropsychs um, done with him. So the first one came for his ADHD and then he was also red flagged in that first neuropsych as having um, dyslexia, but he wasn't formally diagnosed. Uh, so when we went to school, he was struggling in kindergarten and first grade with um, more of like behavioral. It wasn't bad, but it was like he would throw crayons when he got frustrated or he would rip up his paper when he got mad and he would, you know, get, get angry and yell and um, so the, the school recommended, which technically they can't, but they recommended I look at um, ADHD for behavioral issues for him. So, but they didn't. Uh, I went and did it ourselves outside um, and paved the neuropsych. 
So we got him um, diagnosed and we got him medicated um, and his ADHD was uh, 10 times better. Uh, he went from being the child to blowing up in school and getting angry to being the child that sat there and like just really didn't say much and um, not, not you know acting out, things like that. But his reading and his math and his writing just plummeted. I mean, it was it was non-existent from from day one. So once the medication was in and we had the behaviorals out of the way, we I, I decided to push harder for um, reading and math and writing goals. And we were told that he did qualify for an IEP at that point. They tried to push for a 504 as well. Um, but I pushed harder and made sure that he got the um, IEP instead of the 504 only because I wanted goals um, in implemented into the IEP, not just accommodations, where I think that's the difference uh, in between a 504 and an IEP. The main difference is that if you have a child who is like, like Katie or Dawn, like your, like your, um, your son, or Jane, like your daughter, where they're they're floating on the surface. Are they struggling? Yes, but if you're not looking for the school to like give them pullouts um, and to build their their reading to back, you know, like to try to close a gap, then a 504 would definitely fit for that purpose. I mean, an IEP is I I've always told people to push for an IEP as long as you as hard as you can. But if the school is going to outright deny it then a 504 is, is just as great for accommodations. Taking time on tests, having breaks, um, se separate classrooms, things like that uh, are, is wonderful. I mean, it will help tremendously. With my son, those accommodations were great, but he was so behind on reading that even if we would have put accommodations in, he still wouldn't have gone anywhere. So I wanted to have goals. I wanted the school to fix him. It, at that at that point is what I was looking at is I wanted them to fix him. I didn't want to have to go outside and, and get tutoring services and I didn't want to have to have him tutor outside of school after being in, in school for eight hours. I didn't want to have to pay for tutoring. I wanted the school to do it. That's their, that's their job in my opinion is what they were supposed to be doing. So we I pushed for an IEP. They did not uh, do an SLD. Um, IEP, which is Specific Learning Disability, they put him under OHI, which is Other Health Impairments, um, and that he covered with his ADHD. So the goals that were in place were not reading goals. They were, uh, the child will pay attention for this certain amount of time to be able to read this amount of a, a text. Well, it wasn't teaching how to read. It was just making sure that he sat there and actually read it and paid attention long enough. But it didn't, the goals weren't in place for the actual reading part of it. Um, the decoding, the encoding, um, that kind of stuff. So he continued to fall farther and farther and farther behind. Um, they implemented gum to help read. So the child would chew gum during reading so that he can focus longer and be able to read the text that was that was given to him um and that was probably the turning point where i was like you seriously in front of a, the whole group i was like you seriously think I'm, you're going to give my child gum and it's going to help him read like sure it might help his attention because he's focusing on chewing on something but it's not going to help him learn to read let's put it inside there and then tell him to sound out a word yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense, right? So that point I knew I was I was at a battle. This was three years, four years with kindergarten or three kindergarten uh, fighting. And I I just didn't have the faith that they were gonna be able to do what they needed to do. So I looked outside the district. Um he was at the time I didn't know because they weren't giving me the like the proper scores. Nothing was like written that I could understand it at that time. So I didn't know exactly how significantly behind he was until we went outside the district and got him evaluated through a program called Linda Mood Bell. And I found out that my child wasn't even kindergarten. He was pre-kindergarten. So he was like the third, fourth percentile in um, reading. And he hadn't even like got the basics of reading, like the understanding of the letter sounds. He couldn't even rhyme. 
Um, none of that was happening. So he was in the fourth grade and reading at pre-kindergarten level. So he wasn't even reading. Um, and when I brought that back to the school, they were like, well, we understand all this, but his attention just really is, is not there to be, able, to be able to learn properly. And I was like, no, that's your excuse. That's, that's, uh, we're over. We're over talking about his attention because I've been back to a neuropsych. I've been to a doctor. I can't medicate him anymore. I medicate him for you. He's going to be a zombie and then he's not going to learn anything anyway. So I don't know what you think I can do. He needs to learn how to read. And they started doing a few things. They gave him Orton Gillingham for a period of time, but the, the specialist in our district was not great. And it wasn't, it, they started off at like a third grade reading level because they thought, well, we can't give him kindergarten. He's in the fifth grade. Like heaven forbid we give a fifth grader a kindergarten, teach him kindergarten stuff. So it, he had lost all of that. So when we did Linda Mood Bell, um, it, it was $26,000 for eight weeks. Um, and he grew from uh, pre-kindergarten to a, for a, a first grade half a year. So he grew a year and a half in um, eight weeks. And then we were blessed that the program gave us a, a scholarship, and but we had to travel. This, they came to us. And then the other one, we had to travel to Illinois. Now I live in Northern Wisconsin. So we traveled from Northern Wisconsin to Northern Illinois. We left my house every Sunday night and we traveled and stayed in an apartment in um, Illinois for the week. And he was in school for 19 weeks, we did that. And he is now um, in fifth grade and at a third grade reading level, third, three and a half. And that was after 19 weeks. So it, it, <laughs> it makes me cry because we gave up so much. I have a I have a business I have to run, and I have another child who I had to leave and go stay in Illinois with my oldest child. So no matter how hard you fight and how tired you get, what you can get your child is what they need. So I would say, push for IEPs. Push as hard as you can until you can't push anymore, because an IEP is going to set your child up for a lot more than in 504, but I also know how bad districts can fail kids. So I'm not telling you to push until it, until you're not getting anything because then it's, there's no point in, in it. So push until you, they push back. You need to know your laws. You need to know that, you know, I, I bought all of the rights, the rights law books. I sat down and I studied. Like I could have a degree in special education if I wanted to, but I didn't, didn't go to college to do it. I just did it the school of hard knocks, you know? I did it because I needed to. And I walked in there and I was like, nope, you're done. You're done. You're done. You're not, no, that's not happening anymore. And I finally, my son went into the fifth grade and he got an SLD. And he had qualified for an SLD way back, even in kindergarten, because he was so low, but they didn't, they didn't do it. I had thought over and over again that if I had more money, because obviously it went to tutoring, if I had more money, I would, um, I would hire a lawyer, a lawyer and sued the crap out of my district because they have failed, not just my child, many, many others. And that's why I do what I do now. And I make changes within the district currently. And I voice my opinion. I am very vocal. Um, my story is on Facebook. I am in the newspaper. I say as much as I can. I have pushed my district to make so many changes. And every time they, they fall back, I'm right there going, no. No, no, and I, this year because of COVID, uh, I had to pull my child from district. We, he was not, he went to middle school for the first, first time and now I know where all your stories are coming from and how hard it gets to middle school because his confidence that he had gotten back from Linda Mood Bell was completely lost within the first three weeks of school because he got there and he was third grade in the, in the fifth grade and he still couldn't keep up with his peers. And I was like, I'm not, you're not losing your confidence. I pulled him and he is the happiest kid I have ever seen. My parents are like, I've seen, I've never seen this much growth in him because he now is telling me his stories. And he'll be like, mom, I just checked on Google and I use my speech to text. And you know that the richest person in the world is this person. And that was a while ago. And now they do Tesla and they do rockets. And he, 
he loves uh, Legos, just like Katie, and he loves Minecraft, and he keeps telling me he's going to be an architect one day. And I said, good, because I think you're going to be a great architect. And we just met with a friend of ours. Their child is just diagnosed with dyslexia. And my son sat down with them and told him how good it is to be dyslexic, like the good parts about being dyslexic. And I cried. I was just like, dude, my child is my hero. Like, I'm, I, I've learned more about how to advocate and how to be a strong mom because of him. He is my hero. And I wouldn't change anything for the world. I, this fight is exhausting and I'm exhausted mentally, physically every single day, but I would not give it up for 1 million percent, would not give it up because it is hard, but we love our kids and that's why we're all here. And I, that's the advice I have to give you is push that district, push them, ask the questions, get that information. And if they don't qualify, then you know what? It's okay. You can get a 504. And you can get the accommodations. Whatever it takes to help your child is what you have to do. And don't let oh. them just tell you they don't qualify. Yes. No. You need Keep to pushing. ask for the numbers. You yep. need to say the cutoff is this percentile, is this standard score. Show me how they don't fit qualifying for an SLD. Show me how they don't fit qualifying for an IEP. Because as parents, you the IEP is a legal contract. The parents mm -hmm. have due process when you get an IEP. When yep. you have a 504, it's a written piece of paper. If you have a district or a teacher that doesn't want to follow the 504, um, I just learned re recently there is a mediation process for that, but it's not as stringent as the IEP. So if they say you don't qualify, they need to show you the test scores. They need yep. to show you what the state law is. They need to show you exactly where they can't just say well the teacher says he's doing fine they cannot do that yep and bring whatever information you get from the outside a lot of some districts say they don't accept outside sources but if you ask for an IEE they're gonna which is an independent um, evaluation they're gonna get an outside source anyway that does it they get to pick the outside source obviously but they're going to get an outside source to do it. So you bring that in there. And if they say to you, we could not accept this, you say, no, you can and you will. I mean, you are not going to be, a, you're not going to be liked. You're not going to be loved. But you know what? Who cares? Because who you know who's going to love you? Your kid. That's all that matters. I don't yeah, care if, you're, if, you're not, about if, me. if you're not making people uncomfortable who keep telling you everything is fine, you're not doing it right. Yeah. Right, Carrie? I always say, if I'm not <laughs> pissing somebody off, I'm not doing it right. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I am so excited to be your best friend right now. Like, I, like I'm over here trying to be quiet and not jump up and down like a crazy, I'm literally also crying because I'm so proud of your kid. Like, oh my gosh. And again, it doesn't just happen overnight, but oh girl, we have so many things to talk about. Um, the other thing is like, when I have a question, when they do, I'm literally crying. Um, when they do 504s, do they have meetings inside? Like when you have a 504 right now, can you, do you still mean, okay. Can, I, I'm, I'm stupidly asking you this because I want to just say what I want to say. Can you invite anyone you want to those meetings? Like you can for an IEP? Oh, good. Invite everyone you can <laughs> to your IEP meetings, to your 504 meetings, and you need your friend Katie there? I'll be there. I, will I actually have me. been to a few um, parents that have asked me to come to their meeting. Don't IEP alone. That's, That's what, what I Katie say. Katie told me you guys say all the time. Don't IEP alone. Yes. Don't 504 alone. I, we brought in, I needed some more backing, obviously. So we brought in, um, which is the, the CTLS program. So it's the County um, Long-Term Care Children's Program. And because of my son's severe disability, he qualifies for Medicaid. Um, and so now he's in a program based off the county, but they come to every single meeting and they're like, no, if we're qualifying him and Medicaid qualifies him, he qualifies. You need to do this. I'm not saying my district is, is great because I obviously I pulled because they're not great, but yes, you need to be in those meetings. And if you need to bring someone for a backbone, just even bring someone to take notes. I went to one of my friends and I took notes and like I listened to her, her, her principal say, well, you know, you got to look at it this way. We have kids that their guts are hanging out. They've been cut open and their guts are hanging out and your child just has a broken arm. So we need to triage this. And I, I stopped, I didn't say anything until then. I stopped and I was like, 
Well, I'm glad your child's arm is just broken. Like, I cannot believe you just said that. This is a child we're talking about. This is not triage. You don't get to triage kids. You don't get to pick and choose who's good and who's bad. Like, you, they have a problem. They have broken arms. You're just going to leave it broken? Like, come on. What would you do? Um, so, I love you said, Carrie, too, though, about when you said, like, isn't that your job? Like, that's when that video, again, my video, I, again, when you guys go look at it, I'm sorry. It looks like, it's really aggressive. Katie. Oh, I loved it. I was like, I, yeah. I was like, I was just like, like, but I felt that way. Like, I feel that way. It's yeah. like, isn't that your job? If I didn't do my job, I'd get fired. I'm just mm-hmm. saying, like, if I didn't sell furniture, like, I get fired. Like, so, oh my gosh, this is giving me so much, like, I'm sorry. I, this is terrible to like bring it back to me. Like, th- thank you all for everything you're telling and you're sharing right now, because this is like also really making me sad because the, the system is still so terribly broken, but it also shows me that, gosh, darn it. I have some new friends that we're going to go kick some door down, th- doors down together and change this for the entire country. Like I, Wisconsin's first, first of all, because that's where we are. But this is what this, I've had so many people reach out to me since I've been putting myself out there and saying like, hey, this is my story. This is what it is. And then people are like, whoa, 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 it, it, it's worse. And I'm like, what? Like I tell my aunt, unfortunately her kid, like my, my cousin Emily didn't actually get what she needed because it was, she was in high school. And my aunt came to my mom and said, I see signs that like Katie talks about. She's like, go get her tested. And they went and did that, whatever. The school was fighting. It came to a point that I called her when she was driving to her IEP meeting and says, don't make me come down there. Like, I was like, you tell the school district that if they don't do what you say, Katie Fortune's coming. And she goes, Katie, I I don't, I'm like, say it, say it, (laughs) they know me. And so, yeah, that's what I did. It was very aggressive, but it's real, but like, but you don't have to do this alone. I mean, you, you're you going to feel alone. That's what my mom says. People reach out to her all the time and contact her. Not that she knows everything, but she's the mom that says, keep going. You can keep doing it. Like, cause her fighting for me is, uh, you can see me here. Like I'm like, not to like blow up my head up, but I'm pretty darn successful in my job. And I've been working really hard. And those are the kinds of things that you need to do, but it's because of my mom and dad. Like they fought so hard for me and they showed that I could fight for myself. And that's what's so important for these kids is your kids is to know that they can fight for themselves too. It may, it may not happen right now. And again, some of these stories I told you, I've realized in the past couple of years, I'm 32 years old. I didn't even, I'm like, wait, that makes sense. I didn't know that, you know? So it's a, it's a lifetime thing, but yeah, if you can push and keep pushing for the IEP, that's what I keep saying. And then also if your school district, I learned this from someone, I'm not going to name the name, but you know who you are. If your school district says, oh, we're going to wean them off because of like, they're going to go. No, no, no. <laughs> so that's what my podcast is about this week, I believe. And I say, I believe because I forget, I have a lot of them recorded right now. Pretty sure my disability services teacher, Gina Dell. I think that's this week's I have her on and she's talking about, and we're going to come on again. I'm going to have her come on. And if anyone else wants to come and tell their story, you tell me and we'll make this happen. But one thing for me is she, she came to me. She literally emailed me and said, Katie, I need you to start talking about IEPs more in your podcast and your video show. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? She goes, kids are being diagnosed with any kind of learning disability, not being told what their disability is and being pulled from the classroom to get help. They are not doing well because they don't understand. And like, she's like, I need you to talk about it. And I'm like, done, let's do it. You know, like, so that's what's so important too. It's a, yes, you as a parent, but that your child to know that they are not dumb or stupid or whatever, they learn differently. They just learn differently. And that's, that's all it is. And guess what? It makes us cooler anyways. I'm just saying, like, we do things way cooler. So my son said the same thing. I'm just cooler. I know. I I gotta tell you, if I have any issues, if I have any problem in anything and I can't solve it, adult issues, committees, whatever, I ask my daughter and she's like, why don't you just do it this way? And I'm like, oh, I didn't think of it that way. You know, (laughs) like get an outside opinion. All I have to say though, is everyone on this call for like everyone, you are all doing amazing already because as a, as a child, I'm not a child anymore. I know that, but when I, as a child with a learning disability and as an adult with a learning disability, what you are doing for your kids is number one, important, exactly what you're doing right now. Even being on this call only 
is important because you're learning, you're pushing, you're thinking, you're growing. How can we do this differently? How can I help my kid? As a child with a learning disability, thank you for everything you're doing because that is what made me succeed is watching my mom and even my dad, but again, my mom is really feisty when it comes to, and again, my dad being dyslexic himself, it was overwhelming for him to like in the meetings and he worked away all the time, you know, whatever. So I don't want to like discredit my dad. He was the biggest supporter, the biggest, like, get out there and do it. You can do it. He taught me how to weld at 10. I built things in metal at 10 years old because he knew him and I are super close because we connect so well, you know? So you are doing amazing things, but thank you. And everything you're doing here, your kids are watching. They know, and they're, they're proud. They may not say it because they're kids, <laughs> but they're proud. They are. Does anybody have any final questions? I did put a survey in the chat um, and we did record the session. So I don't think anybody said anything uh, too identifiable, but if you have any questions later, feel free to reach out to us while we're um, working on uploading the video. We'll upload it to our YouTube for those that missed uh, today's session. So does anybody have any final thoughts or questions before we head out? I just wanna say what probably will continue um, within Decoding Dyslexia and our group and our planning to add some of these pieces that you bring up of what is kind of missing out there to kind of keep adding it to a list of as we are able to well, as we able are able to either find from other people who have put it together already which is often helpful or we're able to put it together and kind of get more resources and we're trying to make it as accessible on our website as possible like easy to read easy to find all those pieces because there's so much out there and we want parents to find it easily and and not and not have resources kind of be the or your education level will be the determining factor of finding it. So we are looking at that. And we're also looking for more representation on our on our committee all the time because this is a big heavy, this is a heavy lift. And we're all of us are volunteers. So anyone have any interest in that, please reach out to us. Cause again, the more people we have lifting in a lot more places, the the easier this is going to go um, when we really have to do even more <laughs> more lifting on on policy and policies, kind of what's going to turn the tide on some of this. So, thank you. Anybody else? There's four of us on the organizing committee. Um, Andrea's on the organizing committee. Susan, uh, Carrie, and me, and our we're listed on the website too. So, all right. Well, we're almost, we're, we're, we're good for time. We could talk for hours. Like when we do coffee chats, Katie, um, I was gone so long one time, my husband's like, are you coming home for dinner? And I left, <laughs> it was like, a, it was like an 11 o'clock chat. And we just had such a long conversation. I think it was three or four hours later. So <laughs> I love this. This has been so amazing. And just thank you again for asking me to come and speak, but please anyone reach out to me. If you have, like, I'm trying to learn because I'm not in the school systems. I don't have a child. Like I, I want to go fight for all the children. Like, that's what I tell people. I'm like, I'm not having kids because I need the energy to go fight for all of the rest of them. Like that's, that's not the only reason, but one of the <laughs> big reasons. And I'm like, that's something that's so important to me. So please, like, I have Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, reach out. I have a website, go on my website, send me a message, any information. And it may, you might be like, Oh, it's small. It doesn't matter. Yes, it does. And it's super helpful for me. Even today, when we were talking about what schools, um, Jane said that it was like light bulb. I'm like, I need to put something on my website. It's going to have all the schools. It's going to have links. It's going to have contacts. I'm going to, and I know we can, Katie, you and I can partner and things like that as well. We're going to do that. Don't worry. But like, I'm sitting here like, how more can I do this? Because if the more I'm speaking around different places and people can get help, the better it is. And we all have to do it together. Like no one's alone here. Like let's all like arms around each other. Let's like kick the doors down like a little <laughs> army of people that are never going to let anyone stop. So I just am so, I'm so honored and I'm just so grateful to have met all of you today. You guys are amazing people and everything you're doing. So, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us, Katie. Yes. All right, everybody stay warm. Have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye.